provided by the presentation and the presenters. So let's begin. Uh, today, we're going to start off our first session in our conference um, in the area of the concurrent sessions. And this is called Reimagine Online Discussions. What an interesting topic for all of us, whether we teach hybrid or fully online, um, there's always something we can learn about this. But this particular topic uh, it was, um, is to increase student engagement. And this is brought to you by some fellow AQ scholars that I so enjoyed uh, learning with this past spring, 25 weeks uh, in the AQ um, cohort. Jennifer Grew, Meredith Wang, Rose Jed Murray, Rachel Robinson Green, and Marlene Graff. I just feel like I know you, but I don't think I have spent enough time physically with you. So I'm going to turn them this over to uh, all of you. If there are any questions that you have, we'll leave the last little bit for you. And also any chat questions, please put it in there. Remember, participation doesn't always have to be speaking up. We can write and we can participate that way. I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks. Thanks, Marilyn. I, I was definitely going to give you that nod. And I know that there are others on this call that um, were in that course. And I did want to explain a little bit about that um, after I introduce us. Um, so I'm feel very fortunate and excited to be here with all of you this morning um, and to, to be able to see faces, even if they're online. I still really enjoy that. Um, we were talking this morning that there's some of my co-presenters that we've, we've interacted so much um, together this last year, but there's still a few that I have never met in person. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so my name is Jennifer Gruy, and I'm here with my colleagues, um, as, as Marilyn said, Meredith Wang, um, Rose Judd Murray, um, Marlene Graff, and Rachel Robinson Green. And we are a interesting group, I think, because <laughs> we are a group that pulls from many different areas um, within the university. We, we come from different colleges. Um, we've got the College of Ag represented. We've got um, has there's um, other I'm in the College of Education and we're kind of in very diverse areas but where we came together was as Marlene was saying in this um, uh, it, or Marilyn excuse me um, was saying in this AQ course so we we took part this last fall um, if being in a pandemic wasn't hard enough we all decided to <laughs> participate in an online course um, that was 25 weeks long and it earned us a certificate in effective teaching or effective online teaching. Some of the goals of that course were um, to be able to design an effective course, um, produce a, a, a productive learning environment, use active or increase our active learning um, strategies with students, promote higher order thinking um, within our students and um, assess ways that both inform and also promote deeper levels of thinking with the students. And so those were kind of broadly um, some of the goals, but out of this came, so one of the areas that we focused in on this course was our online discussions. And as I, you know, kind of thought about my own experience and my past experience with online discussions and heard from my colleagues, we all kind of um, realized that Online discussions are kind of tricky. Sometimes it's hard to have a, a good, meaningful online discussion with your students and to not feel like you are the only person really engaging or, or you know, putting comments on discussion posts out there and then have it be crickets from your students. And so we learned a lot of really great ideas from the AQ course that we were able to implement within our own courses um, and that's some of those examples. That's what we're going to share today and we're going to talk about today. So, but before we get into this, um, I, we wanted to do a poll with all of you. And I think, Meredith, I think it's in the chat. Okay, it's in the chat. There's a link to it in the chat. I don't want to um, move off my slides. But if you want to click on that and... Um, and then pull up, um, there's a link where you can participate in our poll. Um, some of the, uh, the most common kind of 
problems and complaints that we tend to have and, and just kind of see from your point of view if, if um, you have kind of similar issues with your students or not. Um, and then Meredith, did you want me to click on the results right now or later, right now? Okay, let me um, pull this up. Oh, okay, here's the live results. Can you see this part of my screen or am I still just sharing my PowerPoint? It's due PowerPoint. Oh, it's still on my PowerPoint. To, uh, Let's see, do I have to stop share? I bet I have to stop share and let me share this other one. Okay, so I can do that really quickly. Okay, so um, on our poll we had, do you face um, these challenges in your classes? And so we can see from your participation, this is a live poll. Um, from always to never, we've got really great ends of our poll. Um, you can see some of the common challenges. It's really difficult to get my students to think critically. Uh, don't, it seems like a lot of people put that. Um, online discussions are not as engaging as face-to-face. -face. A lot of people agreed with that one. Students don't see how material applies. Um, students don't do not elaborate on concepts or ideas. So you can see that a lot of these, it looks like um, we have these in common. I'm gonna switch back to our slides. So we're gonna talk about those because not every discussion board um, has the same purpose in every class. And there can be different ways for us to apply discussions in one class differently than another class and different ways that we can engage our students. And these are some of the ways that help, worked for us and helped to address some of these different challenges. The first one that we have is, it's really difficult to get my students to think critically about the material. This is one that I um, could totally relate to. Um, within my students. I teach, my, my specialty is very large general education courses. Last fall, I taught an online course that had a little bit over 700 students in it. So they are very, very big and sometimes not that big usually, but um, it, sometimes it's hard and they tend to be first year students. And so it can be really difficult to get them to dig into the material and get a little deeper. So one discussion strategy that I utilized that I found was um, successful and I was able to get some feedback from my students and students um, commented quite often that this was something that required them to think more deeply about the content. It required them to spend a little bit more time um, thinking and analyzing what they were gonna say before they were posting it. And what it was, and this was actually something that, um, this was an idea I heard years ago, also at an ETE conference and I adapted it and made it work for my class, um, but was using Bloom's taxonomy. So I, I don't use all of um, the Bloom's levels, but I, would, I, I pick usually three or four. Um, and a lot of times it's remember, understand, apply. And I give them a lot of different um, examples of, um, uh, different uh, words they can use that um, within their sentences to uh, ap apply or to understand. And within their posts, they not only have to um, uh, write a discussion post based on the topic, but they have to actually use one of these um, levels. They have to show that they, and somehow tag it, whether it's bold or using a hashtag, um, so they might explain a particular concept with a verb indicating that they are using the one, remember they're using that particular level of depth um, or understand or apply. These have been pretty successful in my class in getting the students to really have to think and, and really think about how the material connects to their lives, how they um, can apply it to a different example um, and so that's been fun to see that within my students. I think, so next, um, so Rose, I think you were gonna talk about the first part of this second um, kind of challenge. Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to address the question that pertained to the poll um, 
pulling on, my students don't see how the material applies to real life or to other course objectives. And will you switch the slide for me, Jen? There's just a few things that I wanted to talk about here in relation to uh, how we get them to tie into the objectives for the particular, and I'm going to kind of say sub objectives, the way I'm going to address this is you have your overall course objectives for the class, but then clearly you you have your own objectives and your own expectations for what you want to have happen in that particular discussion. and. Especially, particularly, I think, for many of us through COVID, we had the anticipation that we wanted to relieve some of the pressure off of the pressure cooker, right? And so a lot of things that I saw in peer reviews and looking at other people's discussions and helping to uh, assist not only my own students, but also colleagues in making their discussion boards more effective was that one of the biggest challenges that I'm including myself in this statement, <laughs> y'all. I'm not. I'm not saying I'm doing it always right, but I. What I did notice was that in our attempt to alleviate stress for students, we cut a lot of corners in making our intentions for that discussion very clear and very transparent. So I'll give you a good example. We would have a discussion post posted that would say, hey, here's a prompt, here's a video, here's a, a book chapter, uh, a section, maybe even a jigsaw, right? Because we're getting better at this stuff. And I want you to read this and then go into the discussion and, and talk about it. And we really felt like from our end as instructors, we're leaving that big and broad and open so that we relieve some of the pressure for our students and we just allow them to kind of naturally go into that conversation and let that evolve. And in our minds, we are thinking, we know what we want because we already read that chapter and we know what the backside of that critical thinking, where we hope they're gonna get. But what happens is, is that you know, in thinking about this in terms of pedagogies of care, what we have to recognize is that when we have students who are new to content, so they are not only taking in new content, but they are also having to be very vulnerable with how they come across to their colleagues at the same time they're processing that information for the first time. And what we know from research is that when our students feel vulnerable, they can also feel a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear, and that can get tied up in what they're willing to put forth into a discussion post, especially if we're talking about some of those hard topics. So I, my first bullet point here is students want your objectives for the discussion to be transparent. And I'm not only transparent, but crystal clear. And I'm gonna to add to that kind of a sub bullet that states lower the stakes at the beginning of the semester on some of these discussions. And I don't mean lessen your expectation. I mean, lower the stakes in terms of how vulnerable they have to be to their peers and maybe even sometimes to themselves as they try to deal with maybe some of their own biases um, some of their own, you know, is their own frame of mind and frame of reference, maybe you're challenging that. And that also can be very, um, create a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear. So, sorry, I have my notes here. So I stay on topic, Jen. I, when I talk about lower the stakes, I'm talking about not for critical thinking, not for the content that you're expecting, but for that jumping off point. So when you're, thinking about how do I make this easier for them, you may have to add an example. You may have to take off, turn off that button that says um, students have to post first before they see other people's comments. Oh, the first time I thought about doing that, I was like, I want them to be accountable. And folks, only you know your class and you know your content. And sometimes you the accountability has to come first. But when we talk about lowering stakes, 
sometimes allowing them to see where other people are at and dip their toe in the pool is just enough to kind of get them to cross the threshold so that it doesn't become a barrier, uh, you know, where they put it off and they put it off and they put it off and then they just have to do a crappy post because it's due. Does that make sense? That procrastination is usually due to the fear, the vulnerability, the anxiety associated with, uh, do I really want to put myself out there? So I'm just, I'm just positing to you guys that, you know, being transparent in your objectives can sometimes be being very specific about what you want and being really specific in those, in your outcome verbs. So don't just say, I want you to learn, or I want you to discuss make it even more specific. I want you to elaborate on these principles. I want you to comment on this part of the article. And you may only have to do this for the first few weeks of the semester. Maybe the first three, four discussions of the semester, we're helping them walk through it. We're lowering the stakes. And then maybe you know by the fifth discussion, you let them know, hey, this discussion you won't be able to see everybody else's stuff first. I want you to really have to dig in and think about this, but we've lowered the stakes enough that they feel comfortable in these settings. So uh, don't simplify too much, be transparent, uh, focus on their skill development. They wanna know how this discussion is gonna help them in the end game. And I'm talking about employment. So put a line in your objectives about, you know, Having these conversations of critical thinking allows for this type of skill development in this field of study. You guys know what that is. Make that very obvious to your students. Include that in there. Um, giving them prompts or connectors rather than just saying, have an open discussion. Be aware that that, can, that has a, a double-edged sword effect for some of these students. Um, I also want to say, in in the end, um, for some students, if they still continue to score poorly on these discussions, it can be helpful, particularly um, if they are graduate students <laughs> who are more resistant to this, I find, than my undergraduate students, um, to have a quick one-on-one. -on -one. I don't always advocate for it in this way, but if I notice that a student is consistently struggling to really evolve in their ability to have a discussion, that we get on a one-on-one -on -one Zoom or I ask them to come in to office hours and we walk through that discussion and we almost have the discussion in class where I can probe and they can answer and they can do it orally and practice orally with me where I can say, I like your line of thinking there. How could you develop that in a written discussion post? Um, that just enables them to do it in a different way where maybe the, the writing is very difficult, but orally to think through that and say, how can we take what we've done here in a face-to-face -face session and translate that into a written discussion with your peers? Okay, that's all I got. Thanks, Rose. So the next um, kind of discussion application I had was, and I'll just talk about this briefly, is getting students doing. I think often when I think of ha having an online discussion, I, I think I want those students to think, I want them to sit there and um, work on <laughs> really articulating and, and thinking about what they're writing and what they're, uh, what they're saying. And one, aspect that can be really a positive aspect to getting them to think is getting them to do before they sit down and and think about it and write it and so a lot of my discussion topics start off with the students having to do something having to get away from their computer and having to engage in some kind of behavior whether it's interviewing someone else whether it's um for and i'm in psychology so i know this will look different depending on whatever content and topic that you teach 
but I, you know, I, there's one that I have students do a meditation for a week before they're able to come and write about it. I have students um, do a behavior change where they have to identify a behavior that they want to change in their own life, go through a plan, um, in, engage in the behaviors that they've outlined in that plan, and then they have to write about it. That helps to have, I've, I've noticed that when I get students doing not just coming in front of the computer and typing away, that we tend to have a richer, um, we tend to pull in more life experience um, when that that occurs. So that's that's my plug for getting students doing, doing before you have them starting to write. The next one we have up um, is Meredith. Meredith, do you wanna take this particular challenge? Yes, so in my class, I really find that uh, I teach in journalism school. So we talk a lot, lot about news and sometimes the topic can be very controversial. And some students don't like news even though they're in journalism school. So it happens that they don't really elaborate and really talk in depth what they're thinking or sometimes they're scared to talk. And for me, when I'm teaching online, it's hard to tell, are you worried that you will say something offending other people or are you just not really thinking critically. So I came up with this solution, it's called video discussion. I give you some examples on the next slide. Oh, sorry, the slide after that, I'll give you some principles if you want to use video discussions in your own class. Jennifer, can you click the next slide for me? Thank you. So when you use video discussions, it's very important uh, to set up some expectation to show students how to do that. What I what I do in my classes is I'll tell them very simply, every time when you participate in discussion, you have to record yourself talking. I will give them a time limit. So they have to talk about something to fill the time. Instead of typing nonsense, it's a lot harder to talk nonsense in front of the camera because you're so aware of your own words coming out of your mouth. So I find that to be very powerful for my students as well. And they have the option to work alone or work with others. They can have a Zoom meeting with a classmate talking about the discussion prompt I provided and record it. And when they're talking with others or just talking alone in front of the camera, the peer pressure and the social pressure somehow comes back because they know other people will see his face or her face. If they say something offensive, people will judge them. So they will be more careful. <laughs> if they say something that's so naive or it's contradictory to the textbook, they will be more mindful of that. They will check their textbook before they talk. So I really like this interaction component, but also I don't force them to work with others. They can just record themselves talking if it's harder to coordinate schedule with online class environment. And I always provide instruction to how to resume, record a Zoom meeting or other recording methods. I just put in some links there. So if students need help, they can find it. And always let them practice first because video discussion is not necessarily natural for a lot of students. You know, maybe some of them have never recorded themselves talking yet. So I always set the first video discussion assignment as introduce yourself. And also in the online class, one thing I really miss is the peer interaction. Students don't necessarily have a study buddy in the class, but when they have to do the introduction post first, record themselves, talk about who they are, it's easier for them to find each other. And what I notice in my class, I mostly teach stuff more uh, junior, sometimes senior uh, classes, I realized a lot of them know each other's face, not necessarily know each other's name. So when they are posting tags in the discussion board, they don't know they have met before. <laughs> what happened is when I ask them to do video introduction posts, they find their study buddies so fast. I will show you more example. Jennifer, can you click the next slide? So I'm showing you three types of discussion. The first one on the far left, that's an introduction video. The boy just talking in front of the camera. It's very simple recording. And after that, somebody come and, oh, weren't you in that class with me last semester? And I say, yeah. And they actually got together, did all the other video discussion in my class together after the first one. So they found each other that way. And it's really when somebody already put themselves out there saying, oh, I want a study buddy. This is me. This is what I like. It's easier for others to respond. So you initiate the uh, the conversation by posting your video out there so other people will respond and it's a really great way for people to connect online and the other example in the middle that's two girls taking my class together they were already best friends before my class and they realized we, I have the study buddy option they can always do video discussion together just did all their discussion together and they also miss each other and what I noticed is they don't start a zoom call by answering the questions. They always start by checking on each other. So what are you doing? How did you do with the last assignment? How did you do with the last exam? What kind of question you had? They actually help each other to learn even before the discussion started. And they also record that part for me too. And I don't mind watching that at all. So I get more feedback 
with the video discussion format. The last one is a boy who is a gaming kind of a professional. I don't really understand what he does on YouTube, but he has his own channel. He has his own professional gear. When I said, let's do video discussion, he sent me a, a message saying, I don't like to see my face all the time. Is that okay? I use slide. I said, totally. So he made a slide of his response. His face is just in the corner talking and he nailed it. And a lot of people love to know which brand of camera or which brand of the headphone, which brand of the microphone he used and start the interaction that way. I really love the video discussion format because it bring back the peer interaction, bring back the social pressure, but also give them more freedom to elaborate what they want to say. And I also like what Rose just said, lower the stake a little bit because the introduction post is very important. Get, let them get familiar with the technology, know how to record themselves and know that it's it doesn't have to be a very stressful thing. You record yourself on your phone all the time. You take selfies. It can be that easy. Just upload a video, then your assignment is done. It's also more interesting for them because they watch YouTube all the time. They see people talking in front of camera all the time. Sometimes it can be exciting for them to try to persuade others or present their own ideas in the video format. And some students will actually retake re-record themselves a few times before they post. And that's not necessarily a bad thing as they elaborate them, their own thoughts multiple times, they think more critically. And I end up getting more content from their videos than the text post I used to receive before as well. So that's my suggestion. Marlene, I think, um... You or Rachel First, have actually. Oh, okay, Rachel. So the challenge that I'll be addressing, one of the ones I'll be addressing is, my students don't like and complain about the format of discussions. So you can go ahead and switch it, thanks, Jim. Um, I think it's common for students to think of discussions, online discussion boards as busy work, and this can be a real problem. Um, I, I know for me, as we started thinking about switching to online teaching, uh, I, was, I was finding it overwhelming. I teach in the philosophy department. And if you've taken a good philosophy class, you know that conversation is just crucial to good philosophy courses. And uh, in fact, in my undergrad, my very first textbook was called The Great Conversation. So it's like, oh no, this is intimidating. How are we gonna have great conversations? And what ended up for me at least um, part of the time during the, pan during the early part of the pandemic uh, were um, asynchronous online courses. Um, so the discussion boards became really crucial for my courses and I needed them to function well. And there was a lot of trial and error there. And I think by the end, I improved them quite a bit. So I'm feeling like in the, the, the lessons that I learned both as a result of the uh, ACU course and um, having to modify my practices during the pandemic actually really improved my courses uh, and, and the way that the online um, discussions function in them. So one of the, the things I'm thinking about, you know, so, so there are a lot of goals that you might have with online discussions. Obviously you want the students to be thinking critically about the issues and the, the, both of the courses where I use discussion groups are, um, are ethics courses. I use, it in my, I use them in my social ethics course and in my environmental ethics course. And so there's a lot of critical thinking to be done when you're dealing with contemporary issues in those, those fields. Um, but something else that I realized was very important, especially during the pandemic, was building a sense of community in the course. So I know that my, my son, I have a son that just turned 16 two days ago. Um, when he was going to high school, he really struggled during the pandemic with creating these, with creating social groups and feeling, you know, he was brand new to high school, feeling like um, he was he was finding a sense of community there. And a lot of my courses uh, often um involve freshmen in my social ethics course anyway is primarily freshmen it's a um bhu so um so i i, I realized that this is many of my students first semester and here they are in, in challenging circumstances and and they need to make friends and build community and so i try to structure my discussion groups in a way that helps with that um and so what you want to do is or what I wanted to do anyway, and you might want to do also, is to build that sense of community by not just having the, you know, sometimes the comments that pop up in a discussion group just seem isolated. You feel like nobody's reading them. 
right? Um, that you're just that people are just popping in for those participation points. But it doesn't feel quite that way when you put students in smaller groups where individual personalities and perspectives can through, uh, where people feel accountable to one another and they get to know one another. So in my social ethics class, uh, my course tends to be 50 or 60 students. Um, and, and so I break my students up into 10 groups of five for them to discuss these issues with one another. Um, and that's really helped. I'll, I'll be addressing another issue later, which has to do with challenging discussions um, and so forth. And, and, so, and, and students not liking the format of discussions when you're dealing with challenging issues and so forth. Um, and, and this helps too, because the, once students are friends with one another, they're less likely to be rude to each other. So I really recommend this small group participation. Um, I always include engagement rules in, in my rubric. I indicate the number of times I expect them to engage, et cetera. And uh, as I mentioned in the chat, if you're following along with the chat, I also use um, Bloom's taxonomy like Jen does. And that has helped so much uh, because it's, it's provided a very clear, not only has it provided a very clear set of standards that I want them to employ, but it also gives them a sense of what I really want them to take home. And it helps the, me to integrate the, uh, the, the, the material from the text into the material. What I, what I do in my courses is I, I post a, a little article about a contemporary ethical issue, and I might want them to apply Kant or Mill, uh, but then, um, so apply, but then, also evaluate and so forth. So it gives them, they have to show me that they understand the reading and then they have to show me that they can apply the reading and then evaluate the reading in this context. Uh, and that, that helps a lot. Um, and then, so it's also important to provide examples of good discussions because many of these students have never participated in discussion boards before. So you should be modeling both good, good participation and inadequate participation. And it came up in the thread, well, what, what would be some, examples of inadequate participation. For me, it's always things like, you know, there'll be a very brief responses that are like, I like what you said, thanks for participating, or I agree with you, and then just like re repeat <laughs> what the person said. Um, and those are the, the, the kinds of um, participation elements where they're really not digging in. And so one way that you might model good participation for them is you might provide little snippets, get permission from students, maybe past students, maybe current students to say, here's what a really good, good response to a question looks like. Or you might, there's a function in Canvas. I don't know if you've used this before, but it's, it, it can be helpful. You can have students like um, responses and the, the liked responses that tend to bubble up tend to be ones that are really thoughtful and thorough. Of course, there are also downsides to that that you can probably imagine. Um, Things, things can get a little heated in discussion boards and the liking can exacerbate that. So use that with caution. Okay, thanks, Jen. Switch it. So I'm Marlene and we're getting short on time. So I'm gonna preface this by saying if you have any questions on my part, you're welcome to reach out afterwards. My guess is that we'll share our slides and I, I hope that they're kind of self-explanatory. But um, really, my section is all about providing options and variety. And um, my experience with my students was that they were just kind of burned out uh, on discussion words, um, or at least that's what they were uh, telling me. And, and I think that's because lots of classes were doing discussion words in lots of different ways. And um, they were just kind of tired of being on a computer all the time. And so, um, Jen, if you'll go to the next slide, one of the things that I used one time was a Google Jamboard, which looks and it's kind of like a Google Doc. But we had a synchronous Zoom session uh, once a week in this class. And so uh, for this one, I put them in breakout groups and they were assigned a slide on the Google Jamboard. And then they were supposed to have a discussion about their experience in the class so far and answer these questions. So it functioned as a group midterm evaluation. And then they also had the option to go and um, add to that if there was you know, a, a complaint or concern that they wanted me to know about. Um, but one of the benefits of doing it in a group setting like this 
was it, it kind of helped neutralize the outliers. And so um, like I got a more accurate pulse of what the majority of, of people in the class were feeling at that point in the course. You can go to the next slide, Jen. So this one um, it just shows an example of giving uh, multiple prompts and then they can choose one or two of those props and uh, respond to it so that not everyone is responding to the same prompt. So in this particular class, I had 80 students. And so it helped to put them in smaller groups and also give them more than one question to respond to so that they're, um, so that not everyone was saying the same thing in a different way on the discussion board. The next example on the next slide um, is just showing an example that I provided. And so I think this has already been stated that sometimes students are a little bit uh, gun shy to participate, especially to be the first one to post if they don't know exactly what the expectations are. And so I would often try to provide an example that showed you know, thoughtfulness or thoroughness or, or the elements that I was looking for so that they could kind of model that. You can go to the next one, Jen. Um, and then, so this is some feedback from students. I, I also did um, a video discussion um, in a course and then just a more traditional group discussion uh, using some of the methods I just showed you. And so this is um, how, how the results came out. I asked them to rate whether or not they were effective, meaning did they learn something and was it meaningful and worthwhile? Or, and then how um, engaging it was, meaning was it um, something that they enjoyed or participating in or, you know, found um, stimulating. So the, the regular group discussions where they could type out a response, but then they had some options actually ranked a little bit higher, but still the majority felt that both options provided some, well, were engaging and effective. And so, so then the last thing I'll, I'll say is um, you're not limited to just the discussion board on Canvas. You can go to the next slide, Jen. So there's, there's third party tools that are available. Uh, and this is just one example of many. This one's called Yellow Dig and another one's called Packback. Basically they create kind of a, a platform that looks kind of more like um, social media. And it's a little more interactive and a little more, um, well, fun compared to the discussion board on Canvas. So if you go to the next slide, Jen, on Yellow, D Yellow Dig's um, uh, promotional video, then they kind of highlight some of the traditional uh, complaints or frustrations that students experience with discussion boards. So let's say that you're the last person to post on a discussion board to a single prompt, and it's a prompt that's asking for a specific answer, then there's really nothing more to say. And so, um, so Yellow Dig is uh, like their tool is set up to help kind of mitigate that. If you go to the next slide, Jen, one thing that um, apparently makes Yellow Dig different than other tools is the way that they do grading. And so it's not so binary. And um, they can explain a lot more about that on their website if you're interested in that option. But um, I just want you to know that there's other uh, options besides the discussion board on Canvas. You can be more creative. So that's all I have for my part. Rachel, you have this next one in just a couple minutes. You know, I'm wondering, uh, Jen, if maybe we could just, I've said some of the stuff that comes up here. Maybe we can just, am I the last? I can't remember. Yeah, you are. Why don't we just ditch this and open it up for questions? Okay, that sounds great. Um, okay. Okay. That to, um, before we do open it up for questions, I do want to say thank you. And um, I know I, I want to publicly thank my co-presenters, but also um, Travis Thurston and Shelly Arnold uh, facilitated this course for us this last year and were um, incredibly helpful in making sure that I completed it. So. Um, do we have any questions? I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see some faces. And I haven't been monitoring the chat, but um, if any of my co-presenters have, if there's questions that have come up in the chat. 
There's <clears throat> there's a question for Marlene about all the extra tools you are intro introduced. Are they supported in Canvas or do you have to pay extra for them? Good question. So I personally haven't um, tried Yellow Dig yet because I just learned about it earlier this summer. Um, but there is, uh, it sounds like their pricing is based on number of students at, at your institution. And so my guess is that if it doesn't integrate into Canvas, there would be a way to link out to their site. But my memory, and, and Rose attended the same session that I did, my memory is that it is, um, it does embed or interact with most uh, learning management systems. So I know that Packback is another uh, tool that some professors on uh, campus use. Uh, my understanding is that it's kind of pricey, but the more people in your department are using it, the more affordable it, it becomes. And so, yeah, that, that would be something to check with other colleagues about. And uh, one of my colleagues, um, she, she got some extra funding for the first semester just to try it out. And then that alleviated the cost to students. And um, then after that, she was in a better position to make her decision. So um, I don't know that that really answers your question, but I think they do all integrate with Canvas and, and that the pricing is probably reasonable depending on how many students you have. I know we're about out of time. Um, there was, uh, Meredith, maybe this is a good question for you. Um, there was a question about what if uh, students have broken or non-existent cameras? Have you ever had that issue? Yeah, I have. I also had a student who just don't wanna see their own face when they're presenting. So I said, you can use slides and include some pictures if you want people to know who you are. And my student loved that part because they include a picture of their family, their hiking and their pets and their hobby is actually more fun than just one person talking in front of a camera. You can make it um, very interesting or very boring it's up to the students. As long as they cover the basic points I want to cover, I don't care if they have a camera or not. Thanks, Meredith. Um, I know we're about out of time. Just wanted to say thank you all for being here and presenting. We've got like two more minutes, but maybe this gives you a few minutes to get to your next session. And um, thanks, Marilyn, for um, facilitating this for us. So, and thank you all for being here and your time and attention. If you have any follow-up questions, we're all reachable by email.